The Defence Minister, Barnett Danson, has ordered a high-level investigation into the way Canadian military jets have been disposed of in the last ten years. Mr. Danson took this action after being interviewed by the Fifth Estate about the regulations surrounding their sales. They're not as watertight as you might imagine. In fact, any civilian pilot can buy his own warplane. The fuel bill is a bit steep, but the price of a Sabre jet is surprisingly low. The question is, should Canadian military aircraft be readily available for sale? In the dry desert of Southern California, hundreds of old military planes that haven't flown in years sit waiting, waiting for the ax to fall. It's enough to make a veteran pilot weep, but this has been the Pentagon's policy for more than 20 years. Obsolete warplanes that can't be used in training programs or sold to a friendly foreign government must be scrapped. The whole process of melting them down is strictly supervised. Last year alone, nearly 500 fighter aircraft were turned into aluminum ingots. The Americans believe it's the only way to prevent such planes from falling into the wrong hands. They must never fly again. In the 50s and 60s, the pride of the RCAF was the F-86, the Sabre jet, that won the battle of the air in the Korean War. The communist-made MiGs were less maneuverable and often outclassed. In target practice, the Sabre was equally effective as a fighter bomber. Film documentaries depicted the growing mystique of the Sabre jet. This one made by the CBC 15 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the Royal Canadian Air Force proudly presents... The Golden Hawks. The Golden Hawks. Then they were the high point of every Canadian air show. The pilots who flew these F-86s had hundreds of hours of training in aerobatics. They were an elite group, admired by every school kid who ever wanted to fly. But what happened to these planes after they became obsolete? In Canada, they weren't scrapped. Like old soldiers, they just faded away. For several years, more than 50 of them, partly disassembled, have been lying at a private airstrip in Moncton, New Brunswick. This sizable air force belongs to David McEwen, who owns the airstrip and is president of a company called Target Air. The company plans to sell most of the F-86s to a California firm engaged in military research. There are almost no restrictions on selling such planes in Canada or the United States, according to David McEwen. They've always been available to anyone with the money to spare. If, you're, if we were doing it here and we took our cost plus our profit that we usually like to make, an F-86 would roll off the line here, oh, anywhere from uh, 60 to 75,000, depending on uh, the way that the person would want it done with the equipment put in it. David McEwen sold this F-86 for about $65,000 to an American company that converted the old Sabre into a drone, a plane without a pilot. It's used for research work. But this plane was never supposed to fly again when David McEwen bought it from the Canadian government. Well, this I hear from you today. Uh, I would like to know and see what was the condition of their sale at the time. Claudette Nadeau is president of Crown Assets Disposal Corporation. The federal agency sold off F-86s at bargain prices to David McEwen and other Canadian dealers over the last 12 years. Military aircraft may be available for historical or memorial purposes to municipalities or museum at the established or estimated scrap price. On Purchase average, that price was $1,200 per Sabre jet. In fact, one Toronto businessman got two for $1,200. Crown Assets believed they were going to a museum, but they never got there. Crown Assets also believed they would never fly again. Anything that would make an aircraft flyable uh, has got to be removed. It's got to be dismantled completely. 
But those regulations were never enforced. And so, from this tiny airport on Toronto Island, a Canadian F-86 took off, headed for California. The plane was going into private hands. It had never been inspected by the Ministry of Transport. It had no certificate of airworthiness. But the pilot flew the warplane from here. No one stopped him. No one did anything about it. It was the summer of 1972. The F-86 jet, after leaving Toronto and now painted in new colors, was filmed by an amateur cameraman as the pilot began his takeoff from a small airport in Sacramento, California. The pilot was a novice. He never achieved takeoff. The jet had careered off the runway, smashed its way across a busy road, and burst through the walls of a family restaurant called Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. Medical teams found 22 people dead, most of them children. The ice cream parlor was a favorite spot for Sacramento kids to celebrate their birthday. Lift it up, take it, take it back. The fuselage of the F-86 survived the crash almost intact, and the pilot, Richard Bingham, who was not the owner of the plane, climbed out of the cockpit with only a broken arm. The ice cream parlor was located only 700 feet from the end of the runway. The death toll could have been higher if the speed of the plane had not been broken when it struck two cars on the highway. At the scene were Police Sergeant Morris Hallsapple and the Fire Chief of Sacramento, Warren Wilson. They will never forget the day. It was just like a bulldozer, just pushed everything in front of it. Tables, chairs, bodies, everything. Just, just pushed it in front of it. Is that what you saw, Chief? Yeah. Right. Bodies uh, up on top of it. Yeah. It was, uh, all over it. This one was a sickening, sickening job. And the worst thing is, these people, you know, they weren't all dead yet. They died before us, some of these people did. They were mangled. They were under the plane. They were spread out over the top. There's the scratches all along here. You Today, can still see them. five yeah. years later, only those who were there yeah, would know what happened and would notice these marks on the parking lot. Yeah, a forever reminder. This was uh, a very serious incident, created quite a clamor in the United States with regard to re-examination of all of our policies. Richard Bruner is head of the Pentagon's Defense Supply Agency in Washington, which destroys old military aircraft so they can't be sold privately. He was interviewed by Gerald McAuliffe, an associate producer of the Fifth Estate. It uh, ended up in an awful lot of congressional evaluation, a lot of uh, Secretary of Defense interest, uh, even to the levels of the White House. We were queried uh, extensively as to the origin of that aircraft and did we in fact release that aircraft as flyable aircraft. Fortunately, it was not a U.S. military origin. Where did it come from? It's my understanding that it was in fact a former Canadian Air Force uh, aircraft that had been released. I really feel that uh, the Canadian government had a moral responsibility in this particular tragedy. Morton Friedman, a Sacramento lawyer, represented most of the families involved in the disaster. He says the plane should never have left Canada. They permitted this particular aircraft and many others like it to get into the flow of commerce without proper regulation, or controls over who got the aircraft, the type of people that would be flying it, and where it would be utilized. What about the involvement of your own federal government for letting the plane in in the first place? Well, our government uh, was a party to this litigation, and we certainly felt that they likewise had responsibility. As you know, the particular pilot, Mr. Bingham, who flew this aircraft, had less than three and a half hours of actual airtime uh, in the uh, F-86, and the discovery disclosed that uh, he was very poorly trained. We had improper certification of the pilot. Uh, so yes, uh, our federal government likewise uh, bears the responsibility. The, total the $4 million dollar lawsuit was settled out of court only this year. For practical reasons, lawyer Friedman says he did not involve the Canadian government in the action, but sued instead the American owners of the plane and U.S. government agencies. Take an example of one particular family. It was a little boy, nine years of age at the time of the crash. 
he lost his mother, his father, he had two brothers that were killed in the crash and a sister. He also lost his grandfather and his grandmother. Seven people in his family were totally wiped out. In Merced, California, we found another ex-RCAF Sabre. It too was ferried across the border after being sold in Canada by Crown Assets for a few hundred dollars. The pilot, Bob Love, who was born in Alberta but grew up in the States, is a Korean war ace who shot down seven enemy MiGs. The plane is in capable hands. In the millionaire section of Fort Lauderdale lives Don Whittington, a 31-year-old bachelor who loves to fly airplanes of all kinds. The pride of his collection is an old Canadian F-86. Right now it's being repaired, so we couldn't film it. But he owns several other aircraft, including a Lear jet. His family made its fortune in Florida from selling campers and trailers. And Don Whittington likes to spend his leisure time at air shows, especially flying his F-86. It's a great thrill for someone with no military experience to fly a Sabre. Well, there's a lot of people that feel that an airplane of this nature shouldn't be in civilian hands. I don't know exactly why, if they think the maintenance can't be done or if they think the airplane <clears throat> can't be handled properly. I'm not sure which, but there's been a few accidents with airplanes similar to this and a few people killed. And every time this happens, uh, it reflects upon us more. And so always there's a controversy. Well, it's an excellent combat airplane. It's Bob Love, a veteran flyer with hundreds of hours of military training in the F-86, also likes to take the plane to air shows. The plane may be technically obsolete, but the pilot of a Sabre needs that rigorous training. From this way, you have a, a real specialized in, individual that gets all the, the, the training that he should have, formation, the whole works. So it's not a toy? No, no, none of these are. I mean, it, uh, they're very easy to fly. But just to drive it around the sky, uh, there's nothing to it. But when you have an emergency or you have a specific mission to do it, or you're trying to take off on a short runway or something of this sort, then you should know the airplane and your capability and recognize what its capabilities are. And that would take hundreds of hours of training, basically? Basically, yes, right. How did Don Whittington learn? Out of the manual. Straight out of the manual. The manual is very thorough. If you read it and understand it and practice it, it's... It's all you need. While his F-86 is under repair, Don Whittington spends more time with his other planes. He also owns a highly polished U.S. fighter, the P-51 or Mustang, and a German Messerschmitt from World War II. Before we put the covers on it to keep the corrosion down, it works pretty well. In June, he hopes to fly at the Hamilton Air Show in Ontario, although he admits his air show record has been not good. I was taken in uh, October at the air show in Harlingen, Texas. Had a bit of a problem with the airplane when I was flying it. Ended up bellying the airplane in at pretty high speed. That is the result. It's an excellent photograph. It's a little heartbreaking to see it, though. It, uh, you hate for things like that to happen, but sometimes there's just no way around it. This is taken out at Reno this year in September. What it is there, it, I'm just going across the finish line for the record run, and you can see that I was going probably 470 miles an hour or so, and you can see the two lower pieces. This is the cowling of the airplane, and this is the ducking for the carburetor. And what had happened, it had leaned out due to a lean mixture, and it backfired and exploded, and it blew the bottom two pieces off the airplane. It's really quite a picture. This other color picture here is a picture of the F-86. Well, the F-86, we were coming back from an air show, and on the way back home, we had some difficulty with it. And on landing, we had a hydraulic failure, and the main landing gear wouldn't come down. And consequently, we had to belly the airplane in. The main came down, but the nose wouldn't come down, the nose gear. Uh, finally got it part way down, I then landed on a foam runway with no fire or anything, but it, it did tear up the airplane somewhat. We don't know exactly what caused it yet. We still haven't figured that out. It was a pretty interesting year. Three crashes in three months? Yes. Uh, 
That's not good. <laughs> For the most part, civilian pilots are not truly qualified in, in high-performance U.S. and or other military uh, high-performance aircraft. How would you feel, Mr. Bruner, about a pilot of an F-86 uh, who's already been involved in three air crashes and uh, still is in possession of an F-86? I would think that that's an abhorrent situation. I think the U.S. populace are severely endangered when non-qualified pilots are flying high-performance aircraft. Uh, the fact that this has, has arisen uh, is something that I uh, really must, uh, must look at. But I, uh, the Defense Minister, Barney Danson, said he is concerned about our report. His department had the responsibility to cut the center spars of the F-86 jets to ensure they could not be flown again. And uh, it's true, if some fool goes and takes one, flies off the ground and breaks the law again, we can't control that. The lawyer in the Sacramento case feels that the Canadian government is morally responsible for putting these aircraft into the flow of commerce. There, there's some... Uh, question in my mind whether we have any more responsibility than anyone else. We make sure that, uh, and want to continue to make sure, that aircraft that are not flyable are not reflown. Clearly though, the Defense Department safeguards have not been adequate. Bob Love and scores of other pilots less experienced are flying old warplanes of the RCAF. About 1,700 Sabres were built in Canada in the 50s and 60s. They rolled off the Canada Air Assembly line under a licensing agreement with the U.S. manufacturer. As many as 1,000 of them may still be flying in various parts of the world, according to some estimates. And there is still a brisk trade in Canadian-built F-86s. In a Miami factory, we found several that were originally sold by Canada to Yugoslavia. Now they are being made ready for action in Honduras. There's a lot of countries that would love to have this airplane in Latin America and, uh, and South America. It, is, um, it has all the potential. You don't have to go Mach 2 on the deck uh, to do your job. You can't do it if you're doing that fast anyway. And uh, the, in, the in commission rate of an airplane like this is uh, about 200% better than any of the new modern supersonic stuff. With that kind of market available, and if these planes are to fly again, even as drones, why should they have been sold for an average price of $1,200? The federal government that sold David McHugh and these planes at bargain prices is also providing his factory with money in the form of grants because he employs about 30 local mechanics to refit the planes. The corporation exists to bring in the maximum money for old material that the government does not have anymore. That is the goal of the corporation, to try to maximize a return to the taxpayers. High above the California desert, the refitted Sabres that have been converted to drones are now worth about $200,000 until the object of this research work approaches. It's an expensive way to go, but at least the old Canadian Sabre finally is rendered unflyable.